Wilson's disease is a genetic disorder. It is a genetic disorder of metabolism of copper and how your liver kind of tries to excrete copper from your body. And um, with this genetic defect, it is hard for your liver to do so. So then the copper accumulates, not just in your liver, but then leaks into your bloodstream and then accumulates in the brain, in your eyes, in your skin, heart, pancreas, all the different organs. So it is basically a genetic disorder in metabolism of copper and its excretion. Wilson's disease is caused by a genetic defect in um, a gene called ATP7B. It is something called an autosomal recessive, as in you need to inherit a defective copy from both of your parents and not just one. Um, if you just have one, then you can be carrying it forward to next generations, but it is, it is a genetic disorder. So here at M Health Fairview, we are um, one of the few centers all over the nation um, who are recognized as a rare disease center of excellence. Wilson's disease only occurs in about 30 patients per million of population, so it's extremely rare, and so it's important to have your doctors, um, have doctors that are experienced in treating it. Wilson's eye is when this copper accumulates in like different parts of your eye. Most commonly, it can accumulate in the like in the in the periphery of the black of your eye, and it is called KF rings or Cajun flexure rings. But then it can also decumulate in the lens of your eye, giving you cataracts, and there can be various degrees of accumulation. So, so there are a lot of implications, and you need a good ophthalmologist because that's to manage that Wilson's eye. Patients with Wilson's disease should have should avoid eating foods that are high in copper, some of which are a big one with kids is chocolate, but then other few ones are shellfish, nuts, mushrooms, different organ meats. Um, once their Wilson's disease is diagnosed and treated and is adequately controlled, having it occasionally here and there is not a big problem, but starting off, we need to avoid getting more copper in your body because your body cannot get it out as efficiently as it should. So you eat about two to five grams of copper in a general healthy diet every day. It goes via your bloodstream into your liver, and then your liver tries to get out the access, like whatever we, the body doesn't need, by incorporating it into another protein. And when this copper and this other protein, you know, make a different protein, that protein is called ceruloplasmin. So ceruloplasmin is your liver's way of, you know, keeping the bot, uh, copper bound so that it's not free and it's not, it cannot deposit in different, like, organs. So it's just basically a way, a way of your liver to get it out of your body. So Wilson's disease can present in one of the three different ways. So what first is neurological symptoms so it can be as subtle as you know sudden change in kids handwriting or worsening of psychiatric diagnosis like psychiatric illnesses or um sudden suddenly just acting completely off of what they are. So kind of like neurologic manifestations which can be subtle. The second way which I see most of the time is either their pediatricians feel their liver is big or they feel their spleen is big or they do labs for whatever reason and their liver numbers are high and they stay persistently high. And so that is some form of liver disease. And third, which is extremely rare but can present, is when your liver just fails. So you suddenly turn really yellow, your liver numbers are sky high, it's not working, you can have evidence of your kidneys failing, you can have have evidence of your blood, like red blood cell breaking down really fast and you deteriorate really, really fast. So it can present in one of the three ways. Most of the times it presents after five years of age, though now we have been really good about screening, you know, siblings and stuff like that of patients who have that and so we've been diagnosing it earlier and earlier, but five to 25 is typical age group for presentation too. Wilson's disease is diagnosed um, by certain number of blood tests, liver biopsies, and 
eye exams and then uh, we now have more and more um, targeted ways of testing the gene to get the exact diagnosis. So basically there is a screening test, which is the ceruloplasmin. If it's extremely low, then we get your urine copper, which is like a 24 hour collection of urine and get your eyes examined. And if all of them are in the category where you diagnose, then you don't need anything else. It is Wilson's. But if they are like, if there's a couple positive, one negative, then we go ahead and do a liver biopsy where we measure how much copper is there in your liver. Once again, if it's greater than 250 micrograms per gram of liver, then it is Wilson's disease. If it is a little less than there, like 50 to 250, then we go ahead and do this genetic diagnosis and kind of figure out what gene it is and stuff like that. If it is less than 50, then chances that that is Wilson's is extremely low. So next up would be liver biopsy. And then to confirm, we do the genetic testing. Now, occasionally, and as time goes forward, I wouldn't be surprised if we just go ahead and do a genetic diagnosis. But at this time, it is still costly and you have to follow the protocol. And plus, liver biopsy can give you some other idea about where you stand, right? Like how bad it is, what to expect, how will it get better? So prognosis, why is it will help? So. Wilson's disease patients can show symptoms anywhere between 5 to 25. Very, very rarely they can present earlier than that or even outside of this, um, but typically that's a good age group. Wilson's disease um, is diagnosed by different blood tests, some different, like a urine test, which we collect urine for 24 hours. You may or may not require a liver biopsy and you can, you might need some genetic diagnosis. You can also get eye exam, which will help you. So Wilson's disease was one of the first disease in 1950s um, where like this chelators or, you know, people have talked about BAL, which is a chelator that was used back in the day. It would bind the copper and help your body pee it out. And Wilson's disease was one of the first diseases where it was used. Over time, we have now, we now have like very, um, good chelators that are that don't have as much side effects and stuff like that and we can use all those things so if you if you diagnose Wilson's disease early, early on, like at the very early part of this disease where you don't have too many symptoms and you don't have your livers not very inflamed and or if you diagnose it in a relative, like a first degree relative of somebody has it and they're not even showing symptoms, you can use something as simple as zinc. So zinc takes, zinc absorbs, uh, like zinc and copper compete to get absorbed. And so if you give more zinc, you will absorb less copper and then you won't have, and then you can prevent having copper deposition everywhere. Now, if you get, if, it, if you catch it a little later, you know, where you're, where you're not um, completely in liver failure or something like that, you can do some other medications. One of the common one is triantine, and that also helps bind your copper and then you pee it out. And then if you do present in that very rare percent of patients where they have just liver failure, it's hard to save your liver without a transplant at that point. Once we start treatment, one, we monitor how much copper you're peeing out, how much, cop how much copper you're retaining in your blood to help us guide whether we need to escalate your therapy. But then on the other side, once you successfully treat it, you can also de-escalate your therapy and go to just using zinc or something like that. But monitoring is extremely important depending on diet, depending on um, your other health conditions and stuff like that, the levels and stuff might have go up and down. So you can expect, once you're pretty stable on a treatment, you can expect at least like every six to 12 month labs and stuff. Wilson's disease cannot be cured, but with medications, it's, it's as similar as being cured. So just taking a zinc every day is not that bad. It's not, doesn't have many side effects. It's just a medication and then you can, you can pretty much have a normal life. 
So they will still have the gene, but their new liver does not have that problem. So the new liver came from a person who had normal gene, and so this new liver will be able to metabolize the copper like a normal person. So, um, so no, they won't have the same disease, but their future generations would still need to be screened for this. The prognosis depends on when it is caught. So if sooner you catch it, better the prognosis. Um, in older days, like before 1950s, when we did not have any medication, it was lethal for sure. And with progress in medicine, we've now been able to get it to a point where it can be very well controlled with normal life expectancy. The if patients present with liver failure, which once again is extremely rare type of in presentation, then they have to be get uh, have to be transplanted in a very timely and urgent fashion. Otherwise, it can be devastating. So, um, neurologically, you can have. Um, symptoms as subtle as bad handwriting, bad behavior to um, psychosis and really bad psychiatric illnesses. It can deposit in your eyes and give you cataracts and vision issues. It can deposit in your pancreas and can give you pancreatitis. It can deposit in your heart and give you like heart diseases and stuff. And so um, it can also deposit in kidneys, in your skin, in various different organs. The most two common ones are the neurological problems and the liver problems. If it is in your liver, it can present with lack of appetite, lack of energy, um, the white of your eyes appearing yellow, the skin appearing yellow like jaundice, your um, urine being really dark in color. Wilson's disease, patients who are treated appropriately have normal life expectancy. It used to be fatal before the treatment, but it's no more the case. M Health Fairview has a long history of treating this disease. We have a lot of patients with Wilson's over here, and um, um, Touchwood, but they have all done they've all done good. Um, the other most important thing about M Health Fairview Rare Disease Center of Excellence is we look at this from a multidisciplinary perspective. So you have top notch geneticists who will who you will need to make sure all of your family gets screened, you have correct diagnosis. You have hepatologists, transplant hepatologists who have done surgeries on babies as little as four weeks old and they're really good and have a long legacy of doing the surgeries. You get um, a multidisciplinary team, as in you have dietitians to talk to you about what to eat, you have neurologists, you have psychiatrists, all who have expertise in working with kids, and um, you have cardiologists, nephrologists, whoever needs to be involved in your kid's care. So it's one stop and takes away the burden of family having to relate everything to everybody. So I think these are some of the very strong points of M Health Fairview that it, that that helps the families who's already undergoing, you know, knowing that your kid has a chronic disease. It has it is a genetic disease and impacts like, you know, siblings and further generations and whatnot. So we are really good about taking the burden of going through a medical system away from you while you deal with this whole new health condition. So here at M Health Fairview, um, we don't treat just the patient or the kid, right? It's it's a diagnosis for the whole family. It's a it's a difficult thing for parents to um, to cope with that their kid has a long term lifetime diagnosis and also implication on their other kids if they want to have kids in the future and kids' kids. So it's it's something where we have top notch genetic counselors who can keep on helping you, you know, as as you go forward. You would be seeing the same doctors. I would be the person, you know, taking care of you before transplant and around transplant and after transplant. And so when in doubt, you you don't have like five different doctors that you have to, you know, communicate with and collaborate with and 
I develop good relationship with this family is because they know that this is the doctor that you go to. And then we also, in the Rare Disease Center of Excellence, we, are, we have what we call a concierge type service or coordinators who help you with, you know, knowing what tests are being done, understanding what that means, understanding how to schedule them, where to go, and understanding which all doctors you need and whether, you know, you need anesthesia, whether you need, can eat or drink before the, that test or not so like so many questions but you'll have one point person who can guide you through all of that help you schedule that we by the center of excellence we are trying to take away the burdens of navigating a medical system and i think that is huge for a family who you know just got a new diagnosis that they have to deal with and and that helps my relationship with the family so we don't think just think about you know copper in this patient's liver and how to take it out but we think about how to help this whole family with this new diagnosis